Hello everyone and a very warm welcome to the UCL Ear Institute. My name is Hannah Cooper and I'm a lecturer in audiology here. I'm really pleased that you're hoping to come and study with us this autumn. This session will give you a feel for the Institute and an opportunity to ask us any questions that you may have. Today I'd like to introduce you to different aspects of the Ear Institute and let you know about the opportunities available to you as students. We'll meet some people who work and study here and then you can chat to us and ask us questions. I'll start by briefly talking about the courses that we offer. As you may know, we offer several postgraduate courses here at the Ear Institute. Which one you choose will depend on your background and experience as well as your aspirations for the future. If you have a science background and want to train to be a clinical audiologist, then MSc Audiological Science with Clinical Practice is the degree programme for you. This is a two year course, the second year of which takes place largely in clinical placement. The programme is intense and will take you from a very basic level of knowledge to a high level of clinical competence over the two years. On successful completion of the course, you'll be eligible for registration with two professional bodies in the UK, allowing you to work as an audiologist in the NHS as well as in the private sector. The MSc in Audiological Science is the same content as the first year of the MSc Audiological Science with Clinical Practice and is an excellent grounding in the theory of audiology. There may also be an opportunity to transfer to the clinical year if you successfully complete that first year of MSc Audiological Science. If you're already a practicing audiologist, then MSc Advanced Audiology is the programme for you. This course will enhance your clinical skills and enable you to apply for senior clinical audiology roles. There are some core modules which will increase your knowledge of anatomy and statistics and develop your counselling skills. Then we have a variety of specialist optional modules for you to develop your interests further. For example, we have specialist paediatric and vestibular modules, as well as modules focusing on auditory implants, auditory processing disorders, tinnitus, advanced amplification and so on. You can also take modules from different institutes in health informatics or clinical leadership so that you can develop a full range of skills. If you hold a medical qualification, then advanced audiology, audio vestibular medicine and advanced audiology, otology and skull base surgery are made for you. These programmes will give you the skills and knowledge you need to enhance your career and specialise in audio vestibular medicine or otology. Again, you'll obtain a firm grounding in core module subjects such as anatomy and statistics. You can then choose from a range of specialist modules, including medical and surgical treatment of hearing and balance disorders, as well as learning about amplification and rehabilitation, paediatric and diagnostic audiology. At the Ear Institute, we have some of the most influential academics and clinicians in the world who are working to understand deafness and fight hearing loss. All of our MSc programmes involve a research project and there are lots of different topics to choose from. You'll be able to work at the cutting edge of research and we offer everything from intricate wet lab projects to translational clinical work. I'm sure you'll be able to find lots to interest you. Our programmes are delivered through a combination of lectures, seminars, masterclasses, lab sessions and clinical observation. Assessments are also varied and range from unseen written exams to essays, vivas, portfolios and presentations. The UCL Connected curriculum will enable you to learn through participating in research and inquiry throughout your studies with us and I'm sure you'll find it a rewarding and exciting process. Now that I've given you a quick introduction to our programmes, we're going to meet some people who work and study at the Ear Institute. First of all, we're going to go across to Jonathan Gale, who's Professor of Cell Biology and Director of the Ear Institute. So thanks very much for joining us today, Jonathan. Um, can you tell me what you think is special about the Ear Institute? Oh, hi, Hannah. Um, so first, I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome everyone to the Ear Institute and welcome them to UCL. Uh, my name's Jonathan Gale, and uh, I have the privilege of being one of the founder members of the UCL Ear Institute and, and now its director. Um, so in answer to your question, Hannah, well, I think there, there are many things that make the Ear Institute special, um, but there's one major thing that stands out, and that's the people, the people who are here. Um, whether it be one of the Ear Institute's academic staff or its professional services team, its postdocs, or one of the specialist education um, staff members, it's, it's the people that are here that really make this place unique. Um, when people come to the Institute, they're not only joining a world class institution, um, they're joining one of the few hearing, deafness and balance problems dedicated research and teaching um, institutes in the world. And I'd like to say that it's probably one of the best in the world. So in answer to your question, it's the staff and students that make the Institute a wonderful place to, 
to work and to learning. Um, I have the privilege to work with people just like yourself, Hannah, who are not only world class, but also passionate about what they do. Um, we're passionate about both research and education here at the Institute. And when students join us, they get an opportunity to become part of that Ear Institute family, a family that will be they will be with for the rest of their careers. Yeah, great. And I and I think that's true, isn't it? For um, particularly for for audiology, it's a it's a small profession. Uh, people know each other. There are lots of opportunities for people to meet again, even after they've finished their studies. So it's not that we just see students for a year and then we never see them again. We meet up with an awful lot of our students. We keep in touch. We know what's going on in their careers. Um, we're always available to, to provide to help and indeed our alumni provide a lot of help for, to us as well. So it's a sort of a, a, a lifelong relationship that we have with our students, isn't it? Absolutely. It's it's really so, it, it, you know, hit the nail on the head. All those things that are offered to people, it's, it's all about the people, both the students and those staff members that are supporting them. And, and Jonathan, what made you decide to research uh, the auditory system and deafness? Oh, well, that's a good question. So, so I'm going to have to come clean straight away and get my cards on the table and say, you know, I've got a vested interest in understanding the auditory system and deafness um, since I have a congenital unilateral deafness in my right ear. Um, I think, you know, being deaf obviously sparked my interest in, in, in the ear, but it, it sort of sparked an interest in how the body works as a whole. As a whole. Um, and so, so I must have had an interest in that from some early age, I'm sure. Um, but I, but I have to give credit to a, a fantastic biology teacher back in the day um, who thought up some really great live experiments that really got me interested in physiology and how things work. Um, and that's what I went on to study at university. Um, so, but then of course, what happens next? So towards the end of my degree, I hadn't really decided on a career path. I dabbled in some thoughts about forensic science, but, but, um, but many ventures when I looked into that got some negative uh, feedback on it. So, so at the end of, you know, in, the, in my final year in doing my research project there, I, I kind of found that a lot of fun and had some success in it. And the idea of, of doing a PhD sort of came to fruition. Um, and that's quite, it was quite strange really, because I was the first person in my family to ever been to university to do a BSc, let alone thinking about a PhD. So it wasn't necessarily a first thought. So uh, I was asked to interview for a couple of PhD studentships, one in Oxford and another in Bristol. Uh, and for lots of different reasons that were on my pros and cons list, um, Bristol came out on top. And, and a primary reason was that the subject matter of that PhD, and that was working on one of the most amazing cells in our body, the outer hair cell. Um, I also hit it off with uh, my supervisor to be, which is Professor Jonathan Ashmore, who's actually still here and part of the, the Ear Institute. And you'll get to hear from both of us more about these amazing cells, the outer hair cells, whilst you're here at UCL. So from Bristol, I went on to the USA, um, where I took my, my understanding from my PhD of how the ear works, and, and in particular how outer hair cells work, but how the ear works normally, to start starting to think about how it goes wrong. And I developed my kind of research ideas into um, understanding the mechanisms of deafness repair and regeneration. And I kind of brought those ideas back to the UK when I started up my own lab here at UCL back in 2000. And then over the next few years here at UCL, I, I had the opportunity to be part of the, the group that founded the, the new UCL Institute back in 2005. And then, you know, lo and behold, in, in now we're in 2020, and despite all the difficulties we've got going on here, I find myself as director of that Ear Institute. And, I, and as we come back to what I said, it's a fantastic um, opportunity and privilege to be the director of this institute. Great. Sounds like quite an adventure to get to this point. And hopefully people that join us will, will have uh, similar adventures along their career paths as well. That's great. Yes. Thank you so much, Jonathan. No problem. Looking forward to seeing everybody here at UCL, either face to face or online, whatever it might be in the coming year. Um, but we'll definitely be seeing you. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Next, we're going to go and meet Maria Chait, who is a principal investigator and a professor of auditory cognitive neuroscience. 
Hi there, Maria. Thanks very much for talking to us today. Um, can you tell us a bit about what you're working on at the moment? Sure. So uh, the big question that we're um, asking in my lab is uh, how do listeners uh, use sound to understand their surroundings? When we think about it, so although audiology and a lot of uh, basic science has focused on understanding um, the role of hearing in processing speech, so in communication, in fact, evolutionarily speaking, uh, the auditory system developed not so much for speech processing, but for to support our survival in the environment. Our ears are always open. They're sensitive to a much larger space than the visual system. So whereas what we see is determined by our gaze direction, which is only a relatively small angle of space, our ears receive information from all around us, below us, above us, in the dark. And uh, this is because the auditory system serves as the brain's early warning system. It continuously tracks um, what is happening around us, mostly uh, outside of our self-conscious awareness. But then when certain events happen that are behaviorally relevant, so in the in you know in, in our uh, you know history that might have been the, the presence of a predator or prey. Currently it's probably the you know a bike arriving from behind you or somebody calling your name. Um, and it's this role of the auditory system that is relatively understudied but fundamental to assure our survival and the environment back. Uh, back when we were living in the forest and and now, and it's these uh, the, the the work in my lab is motivated by the notion that if we want to really understand hearing and develop better hearing aids and and better treatments or interventions with people uh, with for people with hearing loss, we must understand this function of hearing since it forms such a huge aspect of what the auditory system does. And so to address these questions, we use a variety of experimental tools. We use behavioral tools. So that means we design special sounds that we feel capture this sort of early warning function of the auditory system and have people listen to them and, and respond to various events. So for example, we design scenes where, where certain um, source, auditory sources appear partway or disappear partway, and we ask people to detect them as quickly as they can. We also use uh, uh, various forms of brain imaging where we measure non-invasively what happens in a listener's brain when they are listening to sounds in the environment for the purpose of understanding how it works um, in normal hearing listeners, but also what might go wrong uh, when you have various forms of hearing impairment. Um, and um, we also you do modeling to, to try to put this all together and recently also eye tracking um, as a way of, um, of uh, measuring uh, listeners' engagement with the environment. Well, it sounds like you have lots of different variety in your lab and you're investigating all of these different ways that, that we interact, uh, we as people interact with the sound environment. Can you tell us a bit about how MSc students can contribute to the work that you do? Sure. So MSc students uh, form uh, a, a really important part of our lab. We recruit around uh, four or five students from all over UCL, especially from the audiology programs at the Ear Institute. And the students take um, the, the projects that they that they choose to work on, so, and that's important. So they're always given a choice about the kind of project that is most appealing to, to their interests. Um, and these could be uh, behavioral projects. So they work in the labs at the Ear Institute. Um, they help us design the sounds that we use and then they, they interact with participants and so analyze the data. We're also moving um, a big chunk of our work online. So partly it was speeded by recent uh, you know, world health events, but uh, this was also something that we were seeking to do for a really long time because it allows us to um, recruit uh, more diverse participants who don't necessarily live in London and hence uh, can come into our to our labs. Uh, students who have a more mathematical background are also invited and encouraged to to do the brain imaging work, although that requires some kind of more more specific training and knowledge. But um, we've we've uh, we've been really. Uh, 
successful and and uh, excited about the contribution that students um, uh, offer to these projects. And a lot of student work um, is actually ended up in publication. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Maria. It sounds like there's loads of opportunities for our master's students to take part in really cutting edge research work. That's really great. Yes. Thanks so much. Great. So next we're going to go and meet Bavisha Palmer, who is a final year PhD student at the Ear Institute. She did her BSc and her MSc here at the Ear Institute as well, and she's also a practicing audiologist. Hi Bavisha, thanks for joining us today. Um, can you tell me how your studies at the Ear Institute have influenced your career in audiology? Thanks very much, Hannah. Um, yeah, the Ear Institute has really influenced all of my career. I think that the Ear Institute has particularly been a melting pot of ideas and research and opportunities and networks throughout my entire undergraduate and postgraduate education. Um, I qualified in 2012 from a BSc in audiology. Um, and so then I spent a few years um, as an audiologist in the NHS. And then I came back to the Ear Institute um, to do my MSc in advanced audiology. And that really helped me specialise in um, pa paediatric audiology, which is something I was really passionate about. And that um, actually led me to a position of lead paediatric audiologist in the NHS. Um, not only that, because my MSc research project actually led me to do my PhD, which I'm still doing now. So I'm in the final year. Um, and in between that, actually, a few other opportunities led me to working with a charity and spending some time in Zambia and Malawi um, developing audiology services. So each step of the way, my education at the Ear Institute has really influenced different parts of my career and led me to where I am now. Brilliant. It sounds like you've had quite a diverse career, even in quite a short space of time. So it's only eight years since you qualified, but you've done all of these different things. Um, tell, tell me what your favourite thing is about being an audiologist. I think that is quite a difficult question because there's lots of things. Um, but the, one of the main things is working with people. Um, we get to see patients and we get to be healthcare professionals and we get to be scientists. And those three things actually uh, were one of the main reasons why I even applied to, to do audiology. Um, I had an interest in doing medicine initially and then actually I thought, well, audiology ticks all the boxes too. And um, given that it is a fairly, uh, fairly newly developing, if you ask anybody what is an audiologist, not many people can answer the question. And so that gave me a real want to, um, to see what it was all about and to see how I could put my stamp on it. And there's lots of areas that you could almost become a pioneer in a, in a certain area because it is so developing, rapidly developing in research, in the clinical life. But really spending time with patients and um, trying to help them as much as possible. And uh, and also all of the networks and friends I've made along the way have really been my favourite thing. It really is that great combination, isn't it, of some science and also some people and that's what I really love about it too is that you can actually really make a tangible difference to somebody's yeah. life with the science and the technology that, that we're able to deploy. Yes well, definitely a massive sense of that job satisfaction thing at the end of it after seeing patients and and trying your best to really make a difference to their quality of life uh, it's really a great thing. Lovely great thank you so much for your time. Well. Take care. Bye. So I hope that's given you a flavour of what we have to offer at the Ear Institute. Each year we welcome a diverse and global student body and we hope that you will join us this year. We're now going to go across to the chat room so you can ask any questions that you might have.